And one of the great themes that we're going to look at this morning is the fear of the Lord. Just thinking about that, here's the question I would ask you to start. Here's the question I would ask you. What are you afraid of? What keeps you up at night? When you wake up, what keeps you up? What are you afraid of? When Addison was, um, my son Addison was, I don't know, he was just maybe two and we had put him to bed, and we were sitting in the living room, Kelly and I, and all of a sudden he came walking out of his room, and he had little blonde hair, ruffled, just came walking out, sleepy eyes, and we said, Addison, what's wrong? And he said, like, why are you awake? What's going on, buddy? And he said, something is wrong in the night. That was his answer. Something is wrong. Have you felt that? Um, I know the feeling. I'll be honest with you, uh, I know the feeling a lot in the last few weeks. Um, the ending of Pastor Jared's time here is not what any of us would have wanted. And I have laid awake at night feeling fear in the last few weeks. What now? After all these weeks of working with you to lead this church, what now for us? What now for the Larsons? Uh, what's the fallout in the church? What do I need to see that I haven't seen? How have I failed? What's next? Those are some of mine. What are some of yours? When you wake up, what keeps you awake? There are big things sometimes. Our jobs, our future plans, our kids, our grandkids, our marriage, our health. There are global things. Uh, war, pandemic, technology, the environment. What keeps you up? The fear of the Lord. We're going through the Proverbs, and the Proverbs say in this world, they speak to us in this world of anxiety and our own frailties and our own fears, and they come to us and they add another fear to the list. Proverbs 1, verse 7, the last verse we read last week, says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, the Proverbs say, you know, in, in Maine, we say that you can't get there from here. The Proverbs say, if you want to get to wisdom, you can't get there from anywhere else but from fear of the Lord. That's where it has to start. And so what are we to do? Why is that good news? Why particularly is that good news for anxious people like us? One more thing to fear? Isn't there enough without the threat of a scary God? Is this the threat of a scary God? I know some of you have wondered about this, uh, why the Bible speaks about this, and why do the Proverbs insist upon it for us to be wise? I want us to look at several Proverbs, what they say about the fear of the Lord. There are several here listed. There are more that I listed at the bottom. Actually, the Proverbs speak of the fear of the Lord something like 18 or 19 times, so these are not all of them. I, I, I want to look at them with you this morning as afraid, as, as, as nervous, anxious people. And actually, I'm just going to confess something else to you right from the start. I mainly this morning and this week have just been preparing to preach to myself. And if you benefit, I hope you do. Uh, but I've, I've mainly been wanting to speak to my own heart and to our hearts as well. At least I've been applying it a lot to myself. As we look at the fear of the Lord, what is it? And here's what I want, here's what I want to show you, three things I want to... Show us. I want to see again myself. What the fear of the Lord is. What does it mean to fear the Lord? And then what that, how that helps us. Two ways the, fear, the Proverbs say that helps us. What the fear of the Lord is, and then why this fear, this fear, of all, uh, this fear alone, the fear of the Lord alone, calms us when we understand it rightly and strengthens us. So what this fear is and why it calms us and strengthens us. What the fear of the Lord is. I wanna, I'll give you my definition right up front. What is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is an attitude of deep humility that comes from knowing God's majesty. That's how I would define it. An attitude of deep humility that comes from knowing rightly God's majesty. The, 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 one of the first Proverbs on there after 1 verse 7 is chapter 15, verse 33. It says this, Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, 
and humility comes before honor. The Proverbs are meant to be chewed on, so let me read it again. Wisdom, wisdom's instruction, or wisdom's teaching, or what wisdom, literally it's wisdom's discipline, what wisdom teaches us, instructs us in, disciplines in, us in, is the fear of the Lord. And when you learn that, humility comes before honor. Wisdom's instruction is the fear of the Lord. It's the first lesson. So what is the fear of the Lord? I, I've said it's an attitude of deep humility that comes from knowing God's majesty. Old Testament scholar Tremper Longman looks at this word fear, and he says that the word translated fear is neither mere respect, just like general respect you would give somebody, and it's also not utter terror. He says it's somewhere in between. <laughs> somewhere in between, just mere respect and utter terror. Terror. The, the best English word to capture the word fear, I think, is reverence. Reverence, as in profound respect, as in a, a humbling, a deeply humbling awe. Let me just give you some analogies that aren't it, but that may help us get our, our mind around it. It is fear as in being awestruck, uh, silent before something or someone who is awesome. So, for example, before, before this creation, and I, I, we could talk about that for a long time, but let me just pick one of the many parts of God's creation that if you really look at it and try to get your mind around it, leaves you awestruck. Like, for example, our galaxy. Uh, we're in the Milky Way. Have you ever gone up north and seen the Milky Way? I go say up north where it's really dark and see the stars. Have you ever seen them, the Milky Way? Uh, the Milky Way, just our little galaxy, we're learning so much more in the last few years uh, about how big the, this, uh, the universe is. But just the Milky Way, it's big. Uh, it, it's, it's really big. Uh, the sun, the sun is 8.3 light minutes from Earth. Now, what that, here's what that means. It's 93 million miles away. Here's what that means. If you started driving now, you left today and started driving to the sun at 60 miles an hour, and you took no breaks for bathroom or eating, and you just drove 60 miles an hour, steady 60 miles an hour, it would take you 177 years to get to the sun. It's a ways away. That is next door compared to the size of the Milky Way. The center of the Milky Way is 20 7,000 light years away. Which means, listen, if you started driving now at 60 miles an hour, it take you 177 years to get to the sun. But if you traveled not at 60 miles an hour, but at 186,000 miles per second, if you could travel 100, did you hear what I said? 186,000 miles per second. That's the speed of light. If you could travel that fast and you were going to the center of the Milky Way that fast, you'd get there overnight, right? No, it would take you 27,000 light years, excuse me, 25,000 years. Did you hear what I just said? You can't get your mind around that. 25,000 years traveling at the speed of light just to get to the center of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is just the start. Outside the Milky Way, is a, one writer puts it this way, a breathtaking festival of stars if, of which the Milky Way is just a drop in the galactic ocean in which there are now estimated to be two trillion galaxies. 25,000 years to get to the center of our galaxy, oh, two trillion beyond that. Now, what happens when you stand before the one who made that? You're in awe. You know how small we are. It, it's it's it, this kind of, this is one part of that fear. It's awestruck in the presence of one so great. It's also fear as in what you feel in the presence of someone who's overwhelmingly impressive or, or, or powerful or, or knowledgeable or beautiful or maybe even famous. Uh, when you're around someone, have you ever been around someone who just, their knowledge of something that you thought you knew about, uh, it just kind of puts yours in the shade? Or their, their ability to do something, you thought, I thought I was a really great basketball player in eighth grade. And then I got around some other basketball players, and I felt myself recede a little bit. 
Have you ever had that experience? Maybe something in your career, or maybe somebody who just has charisma that just makes you feel smaller. You're, you're, you're around someone who is a knowledgeable or a capable or able in a way that just kind of gives you a little sense of awe and makes you feel a little smaller. Now, here's the thing. Whoever has made you feel that way is, has one thing, one very important thing in common with you. Uh, he or she was a human being who woke up and put their pants on just like you and maybe had morning breath. They're not that different from you, actually. But fear of the Lord is knowledge of one who really is different from us, who is other than us, whose perfections are on a scale infinitely beyond the small differences between humans, and whose knowledge and glory and goodness and perfection and, and beauty is overwhelming. This is his majesty, and we, we are in awe of him. It's fear in, in terms of just his power and size and his, his goodness. And it, it is finally the fear that comes from encountering someone. When you encounter the Lord, you encounter someone with the power to make you or break you, the one who literally has power over life and death, over every breath you take, and yet he is one over whom you can exercise no control and whom you have no leverage. Who has put God in his debt, Paul says? Who does God ever owe a favor what can you ever share with God that he doesn't already have? What insight can you give God that he doesn't already know? When you encounter God, you encounter one who has power over everything and who is answerable to you for nothing. And if you do not stand before this God, the living God, the God of the Bible, with, with a sense of reverence that just makes you realize in the grand scheme of things, you are smaller than you and I think, and he is bigger than you can imagine. And if you don't have that sense, you will never know who God is if you don't start from there. It's like in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Maybe many of you have read them in the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis's book in which uh, he has this character, Aslan, who is the lion who represents Jesus. And the kids, who, uh, the three uh, kids who've come into the, to the wardrobe are trying to, are just learning about this Aslan, this lion, and they're asking Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, by the way, if you haven't read it, the, li the animals talk in the Chronicles of Narnia. And they're asking Mr. and Mrs. Beaver who they're talking with about this Aslan. And Susan, one of the, these children, says uh, about this lion they're going to meet, is he safe. I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mrs. Beaver answered, that you will, dearie, and no mistake. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. And so Lucy said, then isn't he safe? And this is Mr. Beaver, Mrs. Beaver's answer. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Now, that's the fear of the Lord. It's this attitude of deep humility that comes from knowing God's majesty. And wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, knowing then that this produces in us a kind of humility that comes before honor. This is what the fear of the Lord is. It's knowing this God who is good but not safe, and this fear of the Lord helps us. It helps us in two ways that the Proverbs say, two ways. And the first one is for those of us, you and I, who, who deal with anxiety and fear, knowing the Lord rightly, the fear of the Lord actually calms us. You know, years ago, I was reading a commentator on the book of Habakkuk. And I don't remember who it was, and I don't remember where in Habakkuk he was commenting on, but I do remember what he said. He said this. He said, God said to Habakkuk, in, in light of God's majesty and greatness and power, you could look at God's majesty, greatness, and power and draw the conclusion he is too big to care. And the Bible says throughout, no. You are to look at the greatness, the majesty, the bigness of God and to draw a different conclusion that he is too big to fail you when you are his person, when you are his man or his woman. Not too big to care, too big to fail. Too big to fail. So look at the next proverb, Proverb 19:23. I'm going to read it twice. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Uh, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content. 
untouched by trouble. The fear of the Lord leads to life, then one rests content, untouched by trouble. You see, the fear of the Lord is not to make us dour and gloomy and shaky like God's going to, uh, you know, zap us if we step across the line. The fear of the Lord leads to life. It helps us. And, and it does so here, this proverb says, by actually helping us be calm. Uh, the, the, the NIV says, one, then one rests content. Uh, two other translations, the ESV or the NAS, say whoever has it, has the fear of the Lord, rests satisfied. Uh, he will not be visited by harm. Uh, one other, Tremper Longman, again, great commentator on the Proverbs, translates it this way, those who spend the night are contented. They don't pay attention to evil. The Hebrew word is talking about laying down at night and particularly seems to be indicating, used in different contexts, uh, about laying down at night when you're traveling, when you're on the road, and you lay your head down to right, rest, and can you rest when you're not, you remember, you know how, how different it is to not sleep on your own pillow. <laughs> Can you rest content on the road? Longman says, uh, this is not just about, you know, having a restless night when it's not your bed. In the ancient world, this is about the reality that people who were not in their home were in great danger. He points to two stories, which I can't get into, but Genesis 19 and Judges 19, two stories of, of really terrible situations that happened when people were visiting another house and were staying in another home and were uh, attacked by, by evil. And so it's in that context, in a context of radical uncertainty, traveling, laying down your head at night, no police uh, coming around, you're, you're on the road. In that context, the writer of the proverb says those the fear of the Lord leads to life, and then one rests content, lays, sleeps contented, untouched by trouble, because the fear of the Lord calms us. It calms us because he is not too big to care, but too big to fail, and we know we're safe in his care. I want to ask you, if you have a Bible, to turn to Psalm, Proverbs 16. This is the one place I'm just going to walk you through briefly why this is such good news, how he calms us. It's page 1008 in your pew Bible, Proverbs 16, how the Lord, because of who he is, calms us. Proverbs 16, I just want to show you verses 1 through 6. Proverbs 16, page 1008 in the pew Bible. And the first thing I want you to do before you read anything else is just scan your finger down from verses 1 through verse 6 and notice in every verse in capital, in capitals, Lord. Do you see that? Lord. Lord, verse 1. Lord, verse 2. Lord, verse 3. Lord, verse 4. Lord, verse 5. Lord, verse 6. Here's why that's important. Because what these Proverbs are going to talk about is the greatness of God to, to work sovereignly in the world. And it's not just generic God. It's Lord. When you see L-O-R-D in capitals, that is the name of Israel's God, Yahweh. In other words, it's not like, like I could talk about a wife, but when I say Kelly, that's my wife. You could talk about a God or your higher power. When Israel said, Lord, that's their God. Their God who had committed to them in covenant to say, you be my people and I will be your God. Everything about who I am will be for you, not against you, because I'm joined to you in covenant. So when you read this, this is not just saying God is awesome. It is. It is saying God is awesome for his people. Now look, now look, I'm going to skip around because the Proverbs skip around, but I want to just show you a few of these, how this means we can rest in the Lord. It means, look, I'm going to skip around. I told you that because I'm bunching them together. Did I say, tell you that? I'm going to do it. Now watch me do it. Number two, verse two, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Here's, here's the first thing I want you to say. Here's what it calms you. Our hearts are safe in the care of God. He knows them. He knows them. Have you ever tried to go through a difficult time and try to figure out why you did what you did or whether you were just justifying yourself? Have you ever done that? <laughs> trying to defend and protect yourself? Uh, do you know how hard it is to figure out why we do what we do? Have you ever struggled with that? I mean, I, 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 can, I can wrestle all day with, did I give to that person because they needed it or because it made me look good or feel good to help? Was it for them or was it for me? Did I speak that strongly because I needed to speak the truth, or did I speak that strongly because I wanted to score points or defend myself? 
Did I avoid that conflict because I was being merciful or did I avoid that conflict because I was being afraid? And you get to a certain point where you don't know the motives of your heart, but when you have the Lord who is your God, you can say, God, you know my heart, it's yours. You're, you see to the bottom of it, I don't. So I'm going to do my, do my best and give my heart to you. Do you see? Your, your heart is safe in his care. He loves you knowing what's in your heart. It's not just that. Our, our sins and our failures are safe in his care. Verses 5 and 6, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. We're, we're right to be concerned about doing the right thing. There will be a judgment day. But then verse 6, through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. And through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Love and faithfulness. This is the love and faithfulness of God that makes atonement for sin. This is God who we sang in the first hymn is our maker and defender and redeemer and friend whose love sent his son to die for our sins. You can trust your sins and your failures to a God who already was taking work, underway at work to make atonement to forgive you before you even did what you did. Knowing you would do it. He was taking care of it. And not just that, our, our plans are safe in his care. And that's all over this chapter. And I'm just going to read you all those verses that say that. That's all the others. Chapter 16, verse 1. To humans belong the heart, plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. Verse 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Verse 4, the Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. These are Proverbs not about not making plans. The Proverbs have a lot to say about making plans and uh, taking initiative and responsibility. These are plans about, these are Proverbs uh, that comfort us that our plans are safe in God's hands. Have you ever had a plan blow up in your face? If you haven't, keep making them, and we can talk later. We always make plans without all the information about what's coming. We always make plans without all the knowledge we need about our own hearts. We, we always make plans not even knowing what's fully best. And we can get frozen in decision-making, we, or we can commit our way to the Lord and trust that He will work them out. He will work it out. God will lead us in a way that's ultimately best for us. Even, even the hard things. That verse 4, the Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. This is not saying that God is responsible for wickedness. This is saying that God can even bring good out of wickedness. He makes even wicked things serve his purposes for good in the long haul. That's what this is saying. This is saying that even the hardest parts of your story are going to be redeemed by a God who turns everything to his good purpose for his people. The most tender parts of your story will be redeemed by the God who works everything for his purpose so you can trust it into his hands, the parts you don't understand, the parts that are still tender to the touch. And the fear of the Lord calms us. This God, who's this big, this majestic, has this kind of care over every part of our lives. We can rest. What do you need to give into God's hands today because you're carrying it and he cares about it? And you need to put it in his hands today and let it rest. Because the Lord, fear of the Lord does one more thing, just one more thing. Fear of the Lord is an attitude of deep humility that comes from knowing God's majesty. This fear calms us because every part of our lives is safe in his care and it strengthens us because in the Lord is a hope that will not fail. I want you to listen to Proverbs 23, 17, 18. Last one. I'll read it once. Do not let your heart envy sinners 
but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord, for there is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. It strengthens us to keep going because in the Lord we have a hope that will not fail. Why keep going? Have you ever asked that? Why keep going? Have you ever been doing anything good and asked, why keep going? The, 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 the hardest things, often things that are the, the best in the long term, the most valuable to us in the, in the long term, actually are the hardest in the short term. In fact, I think many of the things that are the most valuable in our life, if we knew how hard they would be we w- it, ahead of time, we wouldn't have started to do them. You know what I'm talking about? That job that you might have, you didn't know how hard it was going to be. It sounded great at the time. And then if you had known some of the stuff that was going to come with it, you might have said no, but God has you there. Or maybe, or maybe that, uh, that, that friendship or that ministry opportunity that you stepped into, you didn't know what it was going to be, and you, it was, you didn't know how hard it would be, but your heart was in it, and you stepped into it, and now it's hard, you wouldn't have done it. Or maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's that relationship that you entered. Maybe it's that marriage vow that you made. And if you'd have known, it's great, it's good, but if you'd have known, you might, you might have gotten cold feet. But you you didn't know how hard it would be. But here's what this proverb says. That right now, in the hardest things that are happening, here's what the proverbs say. Right now, in the hardest things that are happening, what you don't know is how much good God is going to bring out of those things. You have a hope that is not based in your wise ability to navigate tough situations. You have a hope in a God who is bigger than every situation you will ever face and who has promised to give you a hope that you cannot be separated from ever. That's what you have. Just like you can't see how hard it would be, you can't see how good God can make it. And so, he says, in light of that, uh, don't envy, let your heart envy sinners. We wouldn't do that, right? Envy sinners? Good church people wouldn't envy sinners. Oh, sure. Come on. Um, you, would go, you might want to just, like, give it a break. For all kinds of reasons, we might envy sinners. But maybe it's just, but particularly here, in terms of just walking with the Lord. And, and let's be real, to keep going with church sometimes. Let me just say that to church when church is hard. Uh, it, you, maybe you envy those who aren't working with the Lord sometimes when it's hard to walk with the Lord or even hard to do church. Your friends are sipping coffee with their feet up on a Sunday morning, and your kids got into three fights before you were five minutes out the front door. Or you, had a, uh, you, you are tired on Sunday morning, and it is hard to get up. Or, or when the relationships get hard and the problems are big, and you just say, maybe... Maybe this is, you know, maybe you just kind of envy those who are sleeping in. And here's what the proverb says. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord. This, why we worship, by the way, why we worship is not because the church is so perfect or flawless. This is your regular reminder. Go and find a church with a pastor who's perfect. I'll wait and I'll never see you again (laughs) if you keep up your search consistently. But I'm not letting you off the hook. Go and find a church who's made up of people who are perfect. I'll wait. Uh, the, 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 The hope of the church, thanks be to God, is not that we are a bunch of perfect and wise people who never do anything wrong and always see what's coming and manage everything perfectly. The hope of the church, the zeal of the church to gather together is that we have a God who is so great and so awesome that he can superintend over every hair that falls on the earth, and yet he loves you and gave his son to die for you and gave you grace and gave me grace we didn't deserve to give us a future we could not earn and we could not get there from here unless he did it. And he's done it. There is a hope. There is a hope that we have in God that will not be cut off. And so don't give up. God is a great God, and if you want to know anything about how to live rightly over the long haul in this life, the Proverbs say you need to start with humility before Him, but then 
Let him calm you. Let his hope strengthen you so that we keep going for his glory. And as we come to this table, which is what we're now going to do, the bread and the cup, as we come to this table, we remember one more, one more great triumphant truth. We've already sung it multiple times this morning. Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and mine, to calm our fears, his perfect love, casting them out. Jesus Christ, who rose on the third day in power and glory. Jesus Christ, who is, as we sang earlier, returning victorious, great conqueror of sin. This King Jesus, all glorious, our victory will win. So as we come to him, as we prepare for this table, would you take a moment of quiet prayer? I invite you to confess your sins and your fears and your failures to the Lord who cares for you.